when you speak to these guys, generally they're guys, I'm sure. Um, yeah. Is there any common theme, you know, that, that, you know, kind of psychologically, you, don't you think, what is it that made these people do this, this extreme mortification of the body, which is life changing? I mean, you could say it's a life changing accident in a way. You know? mm. um, oh, there, there can be so many different reasons for doing that mm. because it's like some people, some sadhus do tapasya, even this very uh, painful one, to have a vision of God, to get connected with God. Other people consider that, you know, through the pain, you get detached from the body. So you are closer to your subtle body. And since you are closer to the subtle body, you are closer to God. And mm. then there are other people that do this kind and that want to develop this kind of tapas, this inner heat, because in this way, they can burn their karma. Because, you know, when you burn your karma, then you are closer to moksha. Because, mm. of course, okay. I mean, it, it's important, the sadhana that you do, the discipline, the spiritual practice that you do. But if your karma, your residual karma is not burned, there's no possibility for moksha. So, you know, doing mm. tapas, you are also burning your karma. Mm. And then mm. there are sadhus who do this for the well-being of society. Because from like a cosmic era, we are in Kaling Yuga. And this mm. is the worst period ever. So the dharma is not supported and especially not by the lay people. So sadhus have to do tapasya to sustain at least the minimum, the dharma in the world. So it's kind of, you know, they do that for us. I and, didn't realize that that was that intent as well in the sadhus. I thought it was yeah, a personal, yeah, you know, it was always personal liberation, but they're also no, going no, for there is also, of, Yeah, yeah, right. there can be also, the, yes, in fact, there are some sadhus, sometimes they are asked by lay people to do some tapasya for solving some issues. Like, for example, it's not raining in a village, please. Right. Uh, there can be a lay uh, mm. devotee asking a sadhu to do a form of penance. Or the sadhu can do uh, tapasya as a kind of vow to end something in the society. Like, you know, I want this to stop. I want uh, a statue of Anuman being built in my temple. And I will stay on my feet until this is realized. <laughs> and this is what they do. Because, of course, then there is the, let's say, the material side of the tapasya that attracts people, devotees. Yeah. Followers. Yeah, I was going to say, anyway. yeah, do you, do, yeah, did you find that um, yeah, of course. some of them are doing the tapas for the sake of fame or, uh, you know, or, or even are, are people doing yoga still for the sake of uh, cities, for the sake of magic powers? Oh, okay. You, These are two that? different uh, things. Uh, yeah, They're I mean, two different are... things, but uh, yeah, the two different yeah. reasons why one might do something so extreme, yeah, right? exactly. which, are, no, which no, would they... be valid potentially valid reasons. Yeah, yeah exactly. Both, indeed. I mean, sometimes you see that uh, there are sadhus that start doing tapasya before a mela, just, you know, to get followers and, uh, of course, money, because then uh, you see the sadhu doing something extraordinary and you give some donations. And so there are this kind of, um, I would not say fake babas, but there are like some babas that are exploiting the situation or the tapasya but usually they do that very temporary, like, you know, may, during the time of a festival. But just to do it, to um, to impress others, no, because you need that kind of uh, intention. You, you have to have a, a stronger faith, especially for doing something like the Kareshwari, means standing, uh, standing up for mm -mm. years or keeping the arms up. Like, you know, you, ne you really have to believe in something to... To, to, to tolerate that kind of pain. And then, of course, there are sadhus who do the different tapasyas because they believe in siddhis. And especially uh, tapasyas that are linked to meditative practices are uh, those that more likely are associated with siddhis. So, for example, I met this uh, Jogi Baba, is a sadhu who lived in a forest in, um, I mean, close to Shantiniketa, West Bengal. And he meditated the three years in the hollow of a tamarind tree in the middle of the jungle, <sighs> almost naked. I mean, this tamarind tree is fantastic. It's a huge, giant. You can really enter inside. I entered. Yeah, it's but like... imagine all the insects and stuff in there. I mean, you must have gotten bitten to shit. 
Yeah, I mean, he said that he was fighting with the yeah, <laughs> environment, yeah. but eventually, but I mean, you know, this is the situation in which you don't know when there is the story and the history, no? Yeah, yeah, Because it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. thanks to his uh, meditation, he was able to create a very peaceful environment inside the mm. whole of, of the tamarind tree. And after three years, he got seed this. And Have you seen... Sorry, you, Dana, see? carry on. No, no, say, say. Uh, uh, no, I was going to say, Jim, when I asked him, have you, when again, you know, Jim Nanderson has also spent much time as, as Daniel has with, uh, with, you know, in, with sadhus. Um, in fact, he's initiated, isn't he? Um, although he would, uh, you know, maybe claim differently or, you know, maybe mit mitigate his initiation as he is want to. <laughs> but, um, you know, nevertheless, the best thing that he could tell me about his cities he'd seen was, um, his guru being claimed to have be able to suck up um, milk mm. uh, with his penis and then and then pee milk again. I think that was uh, on the podcast on our on our podcast when we uh, were talking about um, uh, these uh, these cities. So uh, I didn't think that was that impressive, really, as a city. Me too. A bit, you know, I mean, <laughs> a, a, good, a pretty good part. You know, if you're going to do so, it's not a bad party trick, is it? But you know, it's not yeah. really what I would hope for as a city. Really, yeah. Have you exactly. seen anything better than that? Could you better that? Yeah. I mean, I don't know if I can. Because I mean, see, I think I mean, at one I point like... you talk. Sorry, uh, yeah. Yeah, no. Say, say. I was going to say at one point you really talk about, but you know, like the one thing. I think someone asked you a question on another podcast. Have you, you know, how has your feelings towards this developed as you've gone on with the sadhus? And and you, you, I think you make something kind of gesture saying, "Well, I believe it." You know, I, I you know, I've I've seen enough that I believe what they're doing. You know, to be true, to be real, to be valid. You know. I mean, I think that there, there can be some cities, but, I mean, you know, the list of cities is, is very long and some are like, okay, impossible to believe. I've heard like David is talking about, you know, the sadhu becoming very small and uh, walking on the leaves of trees and whatever. But, uh, I mean, for example, not something that I have seen, of course, but something that I have felt, let's say, with some sadhus, very rarely, let's say, but that they could actually read the mind of people. Right. I don't know if that is impressive for you, but you know, when sometimes you are thinking well, and pretty good. <laughs> that you know, you are thinking in I'm I was thinking in Italian, you know, it's like whatever. And and you know the some and the sadhu is doing exactly what you were you know, wondering or is ask or is replying to questions that you were like just um, okay, and that the next one will be this, or you know, these kind of situations. No, even that's, among that's... many people, you know, you are a bunch of people, and you are doing some practices, and you feel whatever, and the answer that you get from the sadhu is like, oh, okay, thank you. This is what I was wondering. I mean, I don't know, I don't know if this can be uh, an example of cities, but. With some well, people, I think it's a reasonable really... example. Yeah, if you've ever had it happen to you, and I, I mean, my first yoga teacher was a, and you've been in England a bit, haven't you? Well, she was a woman. I was in in the East Midlands, right? I was in Birmingham, right? Like she was a Brummy uh, woman, you know, like um, older lady in the sixties, right? Um, and a yoga teacher, we could say asana, but something else. And um, I had a few lessons with her, like in private, you know, because there's something about her, you know, and, and she had that power, you know. She did some some weird mind yeah. taking stuff like and when it happens to you like that's like it's definitely like wow yeah that's yeah that's it's up, something that, that someone can develop I mean it's like if you work and do exercises on your brain that usually people don't uh, something is going to happen I mean something can happen I have no idea because as Sadhu said if you don't experience it don't talk about that so I don't have cities mm. so I don't know if I can I cannot speak about cities. <laughs> And of course, not in this life, I'm going to obtain them. What was the most impressive thing that, uh, or, or sadly that impressed you the most in your time? Mm, okay, this is a difficult question because, you know, I spent so much time among sadly mm -hmm. that basically and nothing. You must have met so many of them. Exactly. So yeah. basically, nothing impressed me that much anymore. Like, you know, maybe at the beginning, but I forgot about that that kind of experiences. Yeah. But yeah. Um, what impressed me, I don't know. I mean, I think the sadhus, still, still today, the sadhus that impressed me more was this old Baba from the Ramanandi Sampradaya 
very devotional sadhu who made me wait in his uh, temple like for three, four hours, actually was checking on me. He was seeing, he wanted to test me. Like he was like, okay, I'm coming soon. And then he left for hours and I was like, <laughs> okay, I will wait here. And when he came back, I was yeah, still there. Yeah, yeah. So he was like, oh my God, yeah. you're still here. How dare you? But I mean, he was very kind eventually, very, and he was, you know, jumping and using, um, very devotional uh, Hindu approach towards humanity, as well as mentioning uh, the gospel and Jesus, and at the same time, mm. even Karl Marx. So, huh. you know, this kind of very wide and opening mind, able to see this connection among, you know, different religions and different uh, thinkings and this and that. So this is a kind of the kind of guru and the kind of sadhus that I'm really much impressed of like those mm. that go up beyond the yeah, labels yeah. of uh, Hindu, Muslim, and this kind of, uh, you know, just attributions. Because generally you, you mentioned on other, uh, um, other talks you've given that the sadhus really don't often know the text, you know, know the scriptures, exactly. right? It's, yeah, it's an exactly. oral transmission. Yeah. Yeah. It is, yeah. Especially because, I mean, of course, well, they don't trust them. This kind of the sadhus I worked with, because of course there is all there are all those sections that are very much uh, you know staying in monasteries and working on textual sources, and are very much focused on the development of gyan. So you need textual sources. So like in the Dashnami Sampradaya, another Shaiva order, there is the Dandi section, and this is very much focused on textual sources. They are all Brahmins, et cetera, et cetera. But those I work with, they are more like uneducated people, let's say, and who are very much in this uh, parampara uh, way of learning. I learn from my guru because what my guru says is also what he has experienced. Because as I said before, you have to have the experience of what are you teaching to mm. be sure that you are teaching like in the, way, in the right way. Mm, right mm, and so it's, it's yeah. that is also the reason why a sadhu can have different gurus because not one a guru cannot give you all the knowledge that you need for because it will be related yeah. to his own experience so if you yeah, are yeah. if you are interested in other issues stuff and teachings you can go and look for another sadhu another gurus but of course you have to have the permission from your guru mm. Do you see many Westerners as uh, sadhus? Are there many Westerners out there? There are right in of... the Juna Akara. Right. Yeah, it's it, because this Akara, this section, let's say, yeah. of the Dashnami Sampradaya is very open. Yeah. Uh, the Akaras, uh, just to open a, you know, a little parenthesis, the Akaras is, yes. uh, is this group uh, connected to the Naga Sadhus, the, the, the warrior that historically was the, the, the most open group in the Sadic world. And probably they, right. they, they began in that way to introduce the low caste people in the Sadhu society, especially to make them, um, you know, fighting against other groups or working as mercenaries yeah. for temples yeah. or Rajas and so on. So because of these groups, historically, were very much like open from a social point of view. In the 80s, like, the t of the 20th centuries, they also yeah, started yeah. slowing, slowing to open up to foreigners as well. Huh. So well, you see them there. Right, so you do them there, so you see them there. I mean, what is it, a, why when you see them like in, in the, in the Kumbh Mela and stuff, and there's certain warrior sections, right? And they, they kind mm. of got their spears and they're, you know, yes. it's like kind of militant, there's a militancy exactly. about it. The Naga What's Baba. that about? Why? Yeah, then you know, why are they like that? Well, it doesn't because, seem very fitting with yoga, people would say, you know, there's a... There's yeah, a because we have this idea different. of yoga and we have this idea mm. of India and we have this idea of ahimsa, non-violence, right? But mm, mm, mm. it's yeah, it's really yeah. about how you use, again, you have to um, frame people in the setting, right? If you are a warrior yeah. and if you are a warrior to defend your religion or to defend your monastery or simply because the, your guru told you to do that, yeah, you, you, you will use violence and, you know, fighting and this and that as part of your dharma. You will be non... It's like, you know, the Krishna and the Bhagavad Gita. 
you can use violence as the sadhus were doing without being attached. Who, but who are they fighting with? Or I now, mean, the when past, they're militant, who are they fighting with now? Okay, in Other the past, groups of sadhus? In, in, in the past, they were like, uh, eventually, they, they really were mercenaries. So they were doing that for money, I have to say that, because it's like, you know, they, they became so powerful and they were acting like... Uh, you know, kings uh, in specific uh, plots of uh, lands. And they were working for the English, working for the uh, Mughal and different princes. They didn't right. care about religion. They mm. cared about, you know, the, the money that they were uh, getting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. So, I mean, that's why, but it, historically, it's not clear uh, how it, it, we, we see, you know, how, why this kind of ascetic groups uh, formed and developed and who were, and if they started like fighting each other, because there are also yeah. historical uh, records sure of, you know, Shaiva yeah, yeah. killings, yeah. thousands yeah. of Vaishnavas just for pilgrimage, you know, for getting the control of a pilgrimage site. So we have a lot of uh, this different kind of information. And do we also see a kind of nationalistic aspect of, of Hatha yoga and, and towards the anti anti British anti colonial? So they, you know, is there is there that is there that strain there that the, the Hatha mean, yogis were kind of trying to build a, a strength of body and, and and this kind of thing to kind of kick out the British? I mean, we see the Sannyasin rebellion that has been uh, you know very much uh, coloured over the, the, the decades. Right. But the mm -hmm. fact is that, um, especially in West Bengal, um, mm. English, the, the English Raj uh, forbidden sadhus uh, to wander. And so they were against this kind. I mean, they were using Naga sadhus, okay. but at the same yeah. time, they didn't like the fact that there were this kind of, you know, people moving around in the empire and they were sadhus. You cannot, you know, connect it to a specific place uh, or identify them, uh, you know. So they were these people that have to be settled somehow. That is also why English, the, the English Raj was supporting a lot, uh, like devotional uh, groups, uh, like the Ramanandi, the Vaishnava sadhus, because they were more, they were closer to the idea of monks uh, that we have in the Western countries compared to the naked, uh, very aggressive, right. uh, you yeah, know, Shaiva, yeah. Sadhus. Yes. And, and then, unfortunately, as you were, unfortunate, as you were mentioning today, the Akaras, the Naga Sadhus, of course, they don't fight each other. They have organized to be a kind of group. They, we have the family of the Akara, the Akara Parishad nowadays, that uh, has the purpose of defending Hinduism, the Hindu Dharma, but unfortunately, yeah. you know, it's it's very easy to go towards the Hindu right wing. Uh, mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is a very, yeah. very uh, sensitive topic. Yeah, but there's links. There's links there, you'd say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. The, the, there are organizations that are entering the Sadhu Society, like very okay. nationalistic organization mm -hmm. entering yeah, the Sadhu yeah. Society that is going to affect the Sadhu Society. I mean, yeah. it's already affecting the Sadhu Society, but uh, it's going to make it worse and worse. Interesting. And a whole, yeah. other, a whole other kind of branch of yeah. conversation. Um, going back to your experience with the Sadhus, and, and you've mm. been on record saying that you didn't, you know, you've been offered initiations, you've been offered yeah. um, to be accepted in, you know, the kind of inner circle of teaching. You've decided, you know, you didn't want to do that because you wanted to write books um, that, that were uh, public books and the information that you would receive as an initiate would be private information you couldn't share. Mm -hmm. um, did you did you get the feeling that you were excluded? Did you get the feeling that there was teachings there that were kind of really that were perhaps intriguing, interesting, deeper teachings that you weren't allowed to, to you, know, you weren't allowed to be part of, that you were kept separate from? When you were doing your field work. yeah well of course of course i mean first of all we have to remember i mean i was a foreigner and what i have seen from my experience uh, even uh, like i mean i can be uh, wrong uh, of course but this is so this is just uh, what mm. i've uh, and what i've been said yeah. from some mm. sadhus a foreign won't ever get the same teachings than an indian because if you are born outside india it's because of your karma and so it means that you cannot get the same teachings as a person born because your blood is different from an Indian. So you, you will what not you're saying get, is that you won't understand the teachings or they wouldn't give them to you because you're they were not Indian. given. 
So you will get something else. You will get another teaching or they will give you, yeah, some kind of a, um, washed form of that teaching simply because you are a foreigner, because, you know, you, you weren't born in India. And this makes a big mm. difference. I mean, they believe in the karma. So if you were not born in India, there must be a reason. You can get initiated, right. but you cannot get the same result as an Indian. So, of course, I right. mean, I, I, and what I got was uh, the, where the information for even a non-initiated person. So very, I would say they, they are very on the super surface of, uh, yeah. It, yeah, yeah. It sounds a bit fascistic in a way that, you know, no one outside India will have the, you know, the true knowledge, right, that any other. I mean, how, what's their, what are their feelings towards other religions, you know, when, when, in the sadhus? Do they feel that the path of, you know, Jesus is a valid sadhu or, you know, or Muhammad, or, you know? Yeah, that, 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 that depends. That depends. First of all, depends, we have right. to point mm -hmm. to the fact that in India, people are not considered equal, even in their own society, right? True enough. I mean, not mm -hmm. all the people yeah. can enter a sampradaya, if you are an untouchable, you are not going to enter a, mm. a traditional orthodox mm. order. In some cases, mm. if you're a woman, you cannot enter. Mm. So it's like, it's not just mm. against foreigners, it's yeah, yeah, their yeah. own people, right? And also not all the people can receive the same teaching because your nature is different from that of another person. So a guru will teach different things according to the nature of his disciple. And this is very mm. uh, important and, uh, I said, clever, I would say. No, but it kind of, <laughs> but it's interesting and it kind of makes sense. But, you know, but these days, obviously, we're, we're living in the, in, in the world, in the West anyway, where there is, you know, this reticence to accept any kind of structure of hierarchy, yeah. elitism, expertise, right? Um, and, you, you know, that's very much part of the, the tradition of India, that, you know, there's a super hierarchy that, you know, some people are of um, uh, moderate or, or, you know, low disposition, so they will never get, a, you know, a higher teaching. Exactly. Right? Like, yeah, whereas yeah, these exactly. days, obviously, in, you know, in, in the West, it's like, well, everyone should be able to do all things, you know, they all, yeah. everyone has the equal ability, which is, you know, yeah. which is a nice idea, you know. Um, and, yeah, but, but you then know, it's like one day you are a shaman. gets in the way of people. Yeah, and it gets in the way of people actually getting the teaching that they should have, like, you know, and it, you know, rather than someone saying, well, actually, you know, like, maybe you're not cut out for high. I mean, you know, I was reading the Samkhya stuff last night, and I was like, you know what, like, this is just so tough, right? <laughs> you know, the, the, the kind of, you know, discrimination of the logical processes, right? It was like, maybe I'd just be more cut out for a bit of back tea, you know? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, right? that, but this uh, yeah. is exactly the fact. I mean, you, you have to follow the, the path that is better for you, because otherwise you are wasting your time. Exactly. exactly. Say, the, the, having a, um, um, the, the, the human body is a golden chance. Because mm. through the human body, you can get closer to moksha. If you waste it, you know, because you want to be more fashionable or whatever, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's just ego stuff. Uh, you have to really know your nature. That is also why it is important to meditate because, or to learn about yourself and to have a guru that helps you understanding your nature. So you, you can find your, the best path for you.